Now to introduce today's speaker, who you should all know quite well by now, Mahajabin Padamsi. Uh, Maj, I'm just going to pass the screen to you, if you could accept the invitation to present. Um, now, Maj has been the fearless leader of the Beyond Myrtle Rust program since its inception. And with the program wrapping up this month, she wanted to share all the fine accomplishments of the program and provide some clarity for the road ahead. So without further ado, here's Maj. Thanks, Jenny. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, so I'm going to just go through um, talking about our the different stuff that we've that we've done um, and that this has been um, enabled through an Endeavor funded program that I have had the um, opportunity to lead for the last five and a half years. Um, and so I'm going to start with where we were when the program started, um, where we are now, some of the wins and some of the future challenges and a few other things. Um, so in January 2018, less than a year since the Metaverse was observed in New Zealand, most of the observations were in urban settings. Um, and at that time, we only had one observation that was in the native forest, and that was in Taranaki that you see over here. Um, we were at the earliest stage of the infection. And so we had many, many different questions, um, including what are the effects of Australopithecus sidiae on different ecosystems? What is the baseline for different Metaceae ecosystems? Because if we can lose um, functioning within the ecosystems, how do we bring it back to to what it's what it should be? Um, what is the genetic basis for Monica's resistance and susceptibility to Australopithecus sidiae? Um, are there any biological control agents that could be used for Australopithecus sidiae? Um, and how important are Metaceae to New Zealand? Um, essentially, we had lots and lots of different questions at the back um, in our minds. But at the back of our minds was the fact that Myrtle Rust has never been eradicated from any country. Um, and so what we were wondering is that it's not been eradicated, but can we change the trajectory of this disease in New Zealand? Can we minimize the impacts um, for this from this disease? So out of this idea came um, Beyond Myrtle Rust towards ecosystem resilience. Um, and this is a multi-organization program uh, that was funded towards the end of 2018. Um, and the program has been framed around four different questions. How is the pathogen adapting to New Zealand? Um, how does it impact New Zealand ecosystems? How do we control and mitigate the impacts of this pathogen? And how can we enhance Kaitiakitanga and Maori led solutions in pathogen affected ecosystems? So you can read all about the different uh, bits of research on our website. Um, so we had an absolutely fantastic team um, bringing, uh, leading these different research areas. The pathogen dynamics um, that you see over here was led by Scion, um, Suez, and then Alistair, who is at the University of Queensland. Ecosystem impacts that was led by Manaki Fenua. Um, novel mitigation te technologies that's led by Grant Smith from Plant and Food Research. And then Kaiti Akitanga and Maori led solutions that's led by Albie Marsh from Plant and Food Research. We had um, a few people who uh, you might recognize, such as Renee Johansson, who was our project manager. She is now working for DOC, being a project manager over there. And Rebecca Fuller, who is fighting the good fight at Auckland Council. Um, so we've had a few changes in our team along the way, including Jenny Leonard, who you've just um, been in um, met earlier today, which is who's our wonderful science communicator, and Michael Bartlett, who started out as a postdoc in um, in the pathogen dynamics and now is a co-lead. Yeah. 
So but that's not all of the people. There are many, many other people. Um, and we've had different team members and program sup supporters. That includes Mana Fenua, who have welcomed us onto their land to do our experiments, um, different district councils that have helped us um, navigate processes during and around COVID lockdowns. Uh, remember, COVID was a big part as when this program um, was just getting underway. Uh, we also had the Department of Conservation and MPI that have also ensured that this program is a success. Um, and that's also not leaving out all of our international collaborators who have really, really you know, stepped in and uh, made our, our research impactful. Um, we've also had students from undergraduates all the way through PhD students, early, early career researchers to well-seasoned ones, and they're all working together to ensure our many successes. So um, on to our successes. And we have had quite a few. So there have been, we've, we've gotten a long way towards understanding our initial questions that we've had, such as what are the ecological importance of Matesi in New Zealand's forests? We know now that, um, you know, it is, um, it is one of the, it's the second most important uh, family in New Zealand. Um, other things, but looking at sexual reproduction in Ostroxenia sidiae, the susceptibility of different Matesiae. Um, so there are lots of lots of different uh, of different papers that have been published. Altogether, there have been 18 papers, um, and that's not counting the ones that are in the pipeline. Uh, there have been two contract reports and then multiple conference proceedings. Um, so we've even though we we've we have come up with lots of different answers, there are also many, many more questions in different areas to investigate. So um, what are some of our successes? As I mentioned earlier, the Matesiae is the second most important woody family in New Zealand. Um, this was work led by Insu Jo at Manaki Fenua, um, and you can read all about it in his publication that you see on the screen. Um, there's also, we didn't know very much about Lofamodus bulata and Lofamodus apcordata, which were the two um, the two native Matesiae that are really badly affected within the native forest. Um, but we know that now that, that there are about a hundred different organisms that associate with these two plants. And these are plants that, you know, for, for the most part, most people didn't even think about. I mean, a few people had them growing in their gardens, but you know, for the most part, nobody really um, had thought about it until we realized that they are very, very susceptible to motor rust. Um, we also found out that with the um, for Lofamodus bolata, that Archaea sporaceae, which is an Arbusca mycorrhizae, is extremely abundant um, in with this and associated with this particular plant. Um, and that was that was work done by Marley Ford, who was a master's student, um, who looked at the mycorrhizal associations of this of this plant within um, three different forest associations in New Zealand. Um, Rob Beresford led the work on the understanding the latent period for the pathogen and symptom developments, um, and he came up with the motor rust risk prediction model, which is of immense use and has been used in tool so that people could know when do you when do you need to spray when is the um, when is this pathogen around and when is the risk extremely great um, he also uh, has put together uh, from from his work a resource for gardeners so that um, people know what to do and how to take care of their myrtles because people are very very passionate about their myrtles um, work by Peter DeLang showed that honeybees harvest Eurydinia spores, and in fact, actually even more so than they would um, harvest pollen. So those are those are some of the things that that we have done. Um, other work that that has come through collaborations and um, and beyond motor rust um, is that we know that the pathogen Ostroxenia sidiae has the largest assembled fungal genome over um, one gigabase. Um, and 
and that also that Ostrophoxina sidi is capable of sexual reproduction within New Zealand. Now that is something that's really important to be able to establish because that is going to help us when we are thinking about management for this particular disease. Um, we're going to, we've examined, uh, this is work by Grant Smith examining and Dave Chanier to examine the genetic basis for Monica's resistance and susceptibility to Ostrophoxinia sidiae. So that has shown differences and because it's shown differences, it's enabled us to try and understand the genetic basis of this resistance, um, to use transcriptomics, to be able to show that that these spores are actually pre-programmed to do what they do in the first, first 48 hours after they've landed and started to germinate. That enables um, the ability to, to look more closely and to be able to find different targets for control mechanisms. Um, there are fungal effectors that, that are being investigated, um, and then also looking for targets for RNAi. Um, and you can, again, you know, read all about that. And this is work by, by Rebecca Degnan, who um, together with some of the BM Mushabras um, collaborators who have been, who did this wonderful publication. Um, there was also work done by um, by Sarah Sale, who was a, a PhD student, and she was she was working on growing Ostrophoxinia which is a biotrophic pathogen, on artificial surfaces, and enabled um, because she was able to do so, that allows us to be able to go through the infection processes to actually understand what is happening without the plant um, interfering with it. Um, so, you know, this is this is a beautiful um, diagram that came from her being able to to produce the um, the artificial surfaces. So other things that um, that are some of our successes are that there's been a lot of work done on looking for biocontrol agents. There had been about 2,000 different isolates that have been collected. Um, and Haley Ridgway, who's leading this work, has been using single isolates, but then also trying to replace an entire community on the leaf surface to see whether this is something that might prevent um, the pathogen from taking hold. Um, her PhD student, uh, Dan, is looking at mycoparasites. Um, and there's even been a fly larvae, which has been found, mycodiplosis, which actually eats spores of Ostrobroxidinia sidiae. So, you know, there are different different things that, that we are researching. Um, my student, uh, my PhD student Vlad, is looking into Puhutukawa microbes, and you can think about this this tiny little seed, which is um, that has an incredibly complex community that is being um, that may actually promote the success for these seeds to be able to germinate. And when you think about Puhutukawa or Metrosedrus excelsa, they they grow in incredibly um, challenging environments such as you know rocky slopes or um, or cliff faces so the microbes are um, helping it but but that came out of his observation that some Pudukawa, uh, some metros excelsa are heavily infected but they can be close to others that are completely not infected so um, he's still he's still partly partly through his PhD work. Um, work led by Albie Marsh, has, and he has been instrumental in building an indigenous network across the Pacific. And um, one of his students has published this amazing paper on elevating and recognizing the knowledge of indigenous people to improve forest biosecurity. Um, so there's, there's heaps of, of things going on. Um, other successes? Thanks to our, our loyal webinar watches, um, there have been 39 seminars so far. Um, and on our website uh, for Beyond Motorists, there are 58 stories. Um, we've also been uh, really, really committed to, to making sure that Motorists remains in the public's eye. So we've done press releases um, and social media. 
so that this disease is not forgotten about, which is, you know, it's one of the, the big challenges is that you, once you get the funding, you need to make sure that um, you're actually convincing and you're you're communicating with people to show them that that this is important, but not to not to despair. And especially with most of us, like that is a really challenging thing because it's a windborne pathogen. So how do you how do you show people that there is still hope? You know that there is um, something that that they can do. Um, one of the one of the things that we have been um, promoting is is re recording things on uh, recording occurrences of Ostrox and Yasidii on iNaturalist. Um, so lots of successes, but there are also challenges um, as we all face. I mean, one of our um, you know not just fieldwork challenges, but there's of course funding challenges. Um, we are facing a, a funding cliff. Um, Beyond Metaverse is scheduled to end um, at the end of this month. Um, Naraka Takitaki, which was another um, another funding part that um, that did investigations on Metaverse, ended in March. Jobs for Nature um, is our ending soon, um, and we don't know. We don't have a clear pathway forward, so we have no idea like what's going to happen in terms of um, of funding for for this disease and you know and all of the research that has been going on um monitoring has always been an issue we, we've done some monitoring and you you um probably have uh, heard about it through through michael bartlett's work um and others is that you know there there has been some monitoring going on but not not um, wide scale. So what's going to happen once these programs end? Who's going to do the monitoring? As I mentioned before, we have been trying to to get people to um, to log their their findings on iNaturalist. Um, but even then, you know, there have been fewer fewer observations than expected um, last summer. So we need to. Um, because because there there wasn't any dedicated funding for monitoring, um, we've been relying on citizen science to be able to to go out and actually record what's happening with motorists. Um, and there's been some investigation of like why people would do this. Why you know why do they actually um, go to the effort of of recording motorists in um, in in the environment. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, who knows what's what's going to happen with that, and like what's going uh, what's going to happen once the what's the when the fun funding ends. Um, so just to borrow a phrase from the Australasian Metaverse Conference, where to from here? Where are we going to go? What's going to happen um, with the with the funding cliff that is facing us? Um, don't despair. There's there are other avenues of research. There is um, research breeding programs that are um, that are very promising. Um, ecosystem restorations. Looking into plant refugia. You know where do we put our plants to give them the best success so that they are not being affected <clears throat> by Australopithecus sidiae. Seed banking. There are some investigations into it. Looking at RNAi as a tool to be able to um, to protect the um, to to kill the pathogen before it actually causes the infection. Um, monitoring again, like we're gonna, um, you know, people hopefully will keep um, recording where this disease is on iNaturalist, especially if there are any new hosts that that we haven't found out about. Um, and people are looking actively for future funding. But most of all, it's the people. I mean, people are really, really passionate about their myrtles and they want to make sure that these survive into the into the future. Um, and what's, you know, with that in mind, one of the things that we are um, really committed to is keeping that connection between people. We do have a really, active Myrtle community. There are people who are extremely passionate about Metaceae, making sure that you know we don't 
that they don't disappear from our environments. Um, and so with that in mind, what we're going to do is make sure that this webinar series, we're committing to keeping it going until at least the end of this calendar year, so in December 2024, um, so that when future funding does come around, that we don't have to scramble to find the people, that the people are still there and they are connected so that we can hit the ground running with future research. Um, and so with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, the awesome work that you have done and an amazingly productive five years. So thank you. Thanks, Maj. What a uh, what a what a run through of all of the stuff that's been happening. Um, it's it's amazing to see it all in all in one place. Um, another location where people can see it all in one place is on the Beyond Myrtle Rust website. Um, we not only do we have all the webinar series recordings up there, we also have all of our news stories over the years, a full list of all of our publications, um, some some really some really beautiful outputs that show the work uh, that's been done. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to pop them up in the chat. Um, I wanted to start much by just asking, um, is there something that you really hope to get farther with that just wasn't possible? Uh, there are so many things I hope that we could have gotten further with. It's, um, you know, it's just, I think the challenging, the challenge of having a limited amount of funding is that you can only take things so far. So one of our, the main disappointments was that we weren't able to look at many different species. So there are our climbing ratas that we don't really know too much about what's going on with them, um, you know, it, and how we can protect them better. Um, so, you know, having to be having to limit the number of um, of plants that we actually studied during the program is um, was was one of the challenges, and and one of the things that you know we hope to be able to to address if we do get future funding. Yeah, it seems like there's. There's always with science so much more that so much more that one can do and so much more that one can want to do. Um, I am there are a couple of compliments coming through um, and just some general thanks and enthusiasm. Um, do you have when I don't have a question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I think, um, I think I think I think you know like the the thing to to think about is that it has you know when Beyond Little Rust finishes and Narakotakati finishes and Jobs for Nature finishes, the disease isn't finished. The disease is still here. You know, we are still going to have to work to make sure that we control it. Like we've we have some tools that are in development. And it's it's a real shame now that you know that now that the program is ending, we we can't just continue it, and that's that's just not the way that the funding structure works. We can't just continue doing the same thing and submit, resubmit the same proposal for um, for for the funding. We have to think creatively about okay, now what? Like, what is the next step? That what is the most important thing that we need to do? And I really think is that you know like having people involved, making people know that they, um, that they matter, that they can, that they can do things that will help mitigate the impacts of this disease. If anybody has, I mean, and probably this audience is, is not going to be in there, but you know, anybody around Auckland who still has the lily poly hedges, please get rid of them because that really like builds up the inoculum and we don't want that. You know, these are exotic plants that are, you know, great hedge plants. However, they are, they just produce so much inoculum. So like there are things like that, mm. that there's messaging that we want to make sure that whenever we do have the chance, you know, I mean, hey, you might be in the elevator with our prime minister. So if we're in the elevator with with Christopher Luxon, tell him, hey, you know what? I think you need to make sure that us uh, that syzygium, um, that lily pillies should be put on the unwanted pass list. So you know, get mm -hmm. rid of them. 
think about things like how do you convince funders to make sure that this is something that stays in their minds so that if there is any little bits of money that we can continue small bits of research. Uh, you've asked, you've answered Becky Ganley's question that came up as as you were talking, and now you've <laughs> answered it, which is great. Um, is there anywhere to record negative observations? Ah, so maybe I, I mean, you can answer this one. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I will, you're supposed to, if you can, just record the host and make a mention that it doesn't have Myrtle Rust in the notes on iNaturalist, that can be helpful. Is that what you would recommend for iNaturalist specifically? Yeah, so there there is a project. So then, you know, that I, I think that that, one's, that was one of the things that, that was promoted is to, is to go through the, through the project. Um, and so if you have um, a myrtle that, that you see every day, you know, like a big Pudukawa or Rama Rama, whatever, that you can go and you can, keep an eye on the infection so that you know these repeat observations actually are really really useful you know like being able to go back to that particular plant and that, that was that's evidence because we've we've done a survey of Pudakawa over the last two summers um, of Metrocedrus excelsa um, of the same trees of the same hundred trees around Auckland um, and we have been able to track the infection so that is something so that we know like you know that these trees um in the first year of of this and this was during this in fact during this um, survey we also found um the infection on um, the pathogen on rangitoto which is the largest Pudagawa forest that's that's um in new zealand um and th that is you know so so we know that from from last year to this year, some of the the trees that were infected, they have a little bit lower infection this year. That could be because of the weather conditions. Um, but then also, it was important to note that some of the some of the trees that were uninfected before are still uninfected. So those are things you know that that just builds that baseline knowledge to understand what is actually happening in our ecosystems and what's happening to our native trees. Yeah, it's important, it's important work. Um, I have one more question. We have we only have time for one more question um, and I'll pick, uh, have you looked at swamp miry susceptibility? Mm. So swamp miry susceptibility, it was not looked at um, with um, during Beyond Lush Frost, um, but there is bioprotection out there. Um, there is a postdoc, Hanarea, who has been looking into um, into Sizzija Mari um, and to see how you know how susceptible it is, and like also um, to look at the at the microbial community associated with with infected and and healthy trees. So, yep. So there is work being done, but it hasn't been done by us. Yeah, um, but the the take home message there, I guess, would just be that they are highly susceptible. Um, yeah. And they oh, should, absolutely. They should absolutely. be monitored when possible. Yeah. And yeah, and there's if, often tools to be able to help. Exactly. I mean, I think you know, like again, I, I think we just need to keep up, um, encourage people that you know that this is still important. It's not going to go away, and that we just need to you know be aware of it and make sure that that there are ways to. Um, that whatever you can do, you know, do it. Like if there's, if, if you, and I, I think also like one of the things, um, again, you know, not not to harp on Lily Police is that it still mm -hmm. is being sold in garden centers. So, you know, like that's that's something that if you have a, a your local garden center and you see Lily Police, maybe just mention, hey, actually that might not be the best thing to sell. Um, so yeah, there are different things we can do. There's hope yeah. out there. There will be funding yeah. in the future. Yes. Onward. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for today. Uh, thanks, Maj. Uh, thanks for your presentation and for leading us bravely and boldly where no one here had gone before because we didn't have the disease until 2017. Um, a video of today's webinar will be made available on the Beyond Riddle Rest website in the next couple of days, and it will also be emailed to all of the all of the people who registered. Um, 
as Maj said, we are continuing with webinar series, at least until December, but we will be taking a break for July and August. Um, so you'll hear back from us again in September, where we will continue to bring you the latest in Myrtle Rust research. So long for now. Thanks, everyone. Harira, and see you next time.